and honor that we have an extraordinary woman scientist to uh, give grand rounds today. Uh, Bethany Cummings is a, a PhD DBM veterinarian who uh, did her original uh, education at Brandis, Brandeis uh, in Massachusetts, uh, where she had a double major in both uh, biology and economics before coming to Davis for her um, training in both veterinary medicine and getting her PhD. She's uh, stayed on at Davis for some postdoctoral work, particularly around um, metabolic disease and uh, some work with obesity in small animal models uh, with a fundamental basic science uh, approach to answering some of these uh, difficult questions. She then, uh, she's most recently uh, been at Cornell, which is another outstanding veterinary school, and we are uh, thrilled to have her today uh, come present to us about some of the mechanistic drivers of the metabolic benefits of bariatric surgery. So, Dr. Cummings, thank you for coming. It's really an honor to have you in these crazy times. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Sorry, I'm just getting a little adjusted. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. I'm uh, excited to talk to you all about my research um, and am you know, very appreciative for this opportunity, especially during these uh, unusual times. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm not sure what I just did. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Um, so uh, my lab is interested in understanding um, how bariatric surgery exerts its metabolic benefits. Bariatric surgery has a uh, well-appreciated effect to improve glucose regulation and even cause the remission of type 2 diabetes. Um, but I think it's important to appreciate that bariatric surgery also exerts other pretty remarkable health effects that haven't been studied quite as much as its effects on diabetes. So uh, bariatric surgery reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. For example, it causes uh, a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease um, and reductions in blood pressure and can even cause the remission of hypertension. It uh, decreases the risk of various types of cancer and is associated with some negative side effects. My lab studies mouse models of bariatric surgery to understand the mechanisms driving these health effects. We've made contributions in all of these areas, but obviously our focus has been on its effects on diabetes, and that is where my talk will focus today. Um, and I'll present some of our work uh, specific to the papers highlighted in red here, uh, and then also some of our um, uh, unpublished data that's uh, ongoing. There's gonna be two parts to this talk. Um, so in the first half, I'll talk about our work on bile acids. And in the second half, I'll talk about our work on the gut hormone glucagon-like peptide one. And what I'm looking to illustrate in both of these parts is the discovery potential of bariatric surgery. That if we can understand how bariatric surgery works, we might be able to identify new biology and potentially new therapeutic targets. Um, so starting with bile acids, I'll talk about our work looking at the bile acid receptor TGR5 and its role in the glucoregulatory benefits of bariatric surgery. And I'll talk about how our work led us to identify um, a new role for TGR5 signaling in the liver to modulate bile acid metabolism and glucose regulation. And then I'll switch over to our work looking at the role of GLP-1 in the metabolic benefits of bariatric surgery and how um, that led us to identify a new role or a new pathway in the regulation of alpha cell function. Um, so bariatric surgery is arguably the most effective long-term treatment for obesity, and it results in pretty remarkably high rates of type 2 diabetes remission. 
However, the mechanisms remain incompletely defined. So again, the overarching concept in my lab is if we can identify the mechanisms by which bariatric surgery exerts its metabolic benefits, we might be able to identify new therapeutic targets. And in an effort to do this, we've developed various mouse models of bariatric surgery, which allow us to use uh, pharmacologic or genetic interventions to tease apart mechanism. So coming back to our question of how, you know, for a while we thought, you know, it was just because these surgeries induce weight loss and that the weight loss was driving improved glucose regulation. Um, however, uh, clinical studies reveal that oftentimes bariatric surgery improves glucose regulation soon after surgery prior to significant weight loss. This has led myself and others to suggest that some of the post-operative endocrine and metabolite changes may be contributing to the benefits of bariatric surgery. There are many different endocrine and metabolite changes that happen after bariatric surgery. Um, I'm going to focus on these two, uh, which are uh, post increases in postprandial uh, glucagonic peptide 1 secretion and increases in circulating bile acid concentrations. Uh, both of these changes are observed after several different types of bariatric surgery, so uh, sleeve gastrectomy, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery, um, biliopancreatic diversion, to name a few. Um, and this is true in humans and in rodent models. Before we get into that, I wanted to just touch on the surgery type that I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, my lab has developed uh, mouse models of both Roux Y gastric bypass surgery and vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Um, I'm going to be focusing on vertical sleeve gastrectomy today. Um, you know, Roux Y gastric bypass used to be the most commonly performed bariatric procedure in the clinic, but in recent years, this has shifted over to sleeve gastrectomy, and so um, that's what we've been focusing on. Um, and I think it's something that I've always found really interesting is just how um, similar uh, or sorry, how um, despite the uh, an pretty dramatic anatomic differences between VSG and Roux and Y, uh, VSG is still really effective in producing weight loss and diabetes remission. Um, and so this is uh, how we do the surgery in our mouse model. Uh, here, I'll use this cursor. Um, and so basically we remove the majority of the stomach by cutting along the greater curvature, uh, leaving a tubular remnant connecting the lower esophageal sphincter to the pylorus. Um, we also include sham operated controls to control for the effect of surgery. Um, and to do that, we place a uh, suture in the area that would be otherwise uh, transected. All right, so moving into bile acids. So again, bile acids are elevated after bariatric surgery and we wanted to understand um, how this might contribute to uh, the benefits of bariatric surgery. Bile acids are amphipathic steroid hormones with a well-appreciated role in lipid digestion and an increasingly appreciated role in glucose regulation. Bile acids improve glucose regulation through uh, signaling through two primary receptors, uh, TGR5 and FXR. Um, I'm going to focus on TGR5 today, but it's important to note that um, there has been work uh, done looking at FXR, and FXR has been shown to contribute to improved glucose regulation after VSG. Um, and that work was actually led by one of your colleagues at UC Davis, Dr. Karen Ryan. Um, so focusing in on TGR5, um, TGR5 is expressed rather ubiquitously throughout the body. Um, it's a G-protein coupled receptor, and it has several uh, well uh, described functions to improve glucose regulation. Um, so these are first that it can signal in uh, enterendocrine L cells, uh, L cells in the gut, and increase GLP-1 secretion in this location. Um, they can also signal through uh, uh, TGR5 and adipocytes to increase energy expenditure and thereby promote weight loss. And they can uh, signal through immune cells uh, to decrease inflammatory cytokine uh, secretion uh, and expression to improve insulin sensitivity. So based on this, uh, we wanted to test the hypothesis that increased TGR5 signaling after bariatric surgery contributes to improved glucose regulation. And to do this, uh, we used a whole body TGR5 knockout mouse model, and we studied these six groups. Um, so this first uh, SAL, stands for sham operated ad libitum fed. 
SWM stands for sham operated weight matched. Um, so for that, we food restrict the sham operated mice to match their body weight to VSG uh, to control for the effective body weight. Uh, and then we have our VSG groups. Uh, and so we studied these three conditions for both the wild type and uh, knockout genotype. This was our study design. Uh, mice were on a high fat diet for two months prior to surgery. This is to induce obesity and insulin resistance. Um, and then we did some metabolic phenotyping um, and then collected tissues at six and a half months after surgery. Um, so just briefly, you know, as we would expect, uh, VSG does lower body weight and food intake of the mice. Um, and this was independent of TGR5. Um, what I'm showing here is an oral glucose tolerance test uh, data set. Um, and for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to leave out the sham ad lib groups. Um, so I'm showing in blue uh, the VSG wild type compared with the sham weight matched wild type. So we see a dramatic improvement in glucose tolerance that's independent of body weight in the wild type mice. Um, we uh, lose this effect in the knockout mice. And I think this is uh, most well illustrated uh, looking at the area under the curve here. Uh, so we find that the area under the curve is reduced in VSG wild type uh, compared with sham. And this effect is lost in the knockouts. So this demonstrates that TGR5 does contribute to the effect of VSG to improve glucose regulation. Um, and so I told you a couple slides back that TGR5 does things like increase GLP-1 secretion and increase energy expenditure, uh, which are things that VSG also does. Um, so we were expecting to find uh, a role for TGR5 in these effects of VSG. Um, however, we did not. Um, and, you know, it's important to recognize that this was a whole body TGR5 knockout. And so um, this kind of approach does come with uh, some caveats. Um, so there can be issues with uh, uh, confounding due to compensatory upregulation of other pathways. Um, so it's possible that TGR5 contributes to these effects of VSG to increase GLP-1 and to increase energy expenditure. Um, but it was kind of a blessing in disguise because this pushed us to dig deeper and identify um, some new things. So what we did next was we looked at uh, circulating bile acid profiles. Uh, first, uh, we did see that VSG increases uh, total bile acid concentrations in the circulation uh, in both VSG wild type and knockout mice. Um, and so there's uh, a lot of different types of bile acids and they vary quite a bit in terms of their effect on health. Um, and this can be summarized by looking at various indices of the bile acid profile. Um, so this first one I'm showing you here is the hydrophobicity index. And what this refers to is uh, hydrophobic bile acids promote inflammation and impair insulin sensitivity. Uh, hydrophilic bile acids do the opposite. Hydrophilic bile acids decrease inflammation and promote insulin sensitivity. Uh, consistent with this, we see that VSG lowers bile acid profile hydrophobicity, and this is largely blunted in the knockout mice. Um, and so then the other one here is the 12-alpha hydroxylated to non-12-alpha hydroxylated bile acid ratio. It's influenced by similar things as uh, this hydrophobicity index, and increases in this ratio are associated with insulin resistance and diabetes in people. So consistent with that, we find that VSG lowers this ratio uh, compared with sham, and this is lost in the knockout. Um, so overall, these data uh, suggest that VSG improves bile acid profile, um, and that this is at least in part dependent on TGR5. Um, so we were very excited by this finding because uh, it reveals an important role for TGR5 in bile acid metabolism. And so we wanted to understand um, this better. Bile acid metabolism happens in two uh, key compartments. It happens in the liver and it happens in uh, the gut microbiome. Um, we're interested in both. I'm gonna focus on the liver right now and then we'll uh, shift into the gut microbiome. So in the liver, the way this works is um, hepatocytes make primary bile acids. Um, they're derived from cholesterol. Um, and there's a lot of enzymes involved. I'm just gonna highlight two. Um, so the first is CYP7A1, 
which is the rate limiting enzyme in bile acid synthesis. The other one is CYP8B1, which is essentially the molecular switch that determines bile acid profile. So if you have CYP8B1, you'll make cholic acid, which is a 12 alpha hydroxylated bile acid. And if you don't have CYP8B1, you'll make chino deoxycholic acid, which is a non 12 alpha hydroxylated bile acid. So we did some Western blotting and found that VSG lowers CYP8B1, and that effect was dependent on uh, TGR5. We found no effect on CYP71. Um, and so this was cool because it matched perfectly with our bile acid profiling data. If uh, you decrease CYP8B1, you'll decrease 12 alpha hydroxylated bile acids to decrease this ratio. Um, and so basically this revealed a novel effect of TGR5 to selectively regulate CYP8B1 expression. And we were excited about this because CYP8B1 is an attractive target for diabetes treatment. And it's been difficult to target because it's typically co-regulated with CYP71, um, which is not ideal. You don't want to block CYP71 because you're going to block cholesterol metabolism and get a buildup of hepatic cholesterol. Um, and so since publishing this work, we've been focusing on um, how does TGR5 regulate bile acid metabolism and what is the role of liver TGR5 signaling in metabolic regulation. Um, and so before we get into that, uh, I just wanted to summarize um, our findings in this uh, previous study. So the main take homes are that uh, we do not find a role for TGR5 in the effect of VSG to lower body weight or food intake or its effect to increase energy expenditure or GLP-1 secretion. Nevertheless, we find that TGR5 does contribute to improved glucose regulation after VSG, and this appears to be due to an improvement in bile acid profile. Um, and this improvement in bile acid profile is driven by a reduction in hepatic CYP8B1. And this is a cartoon just uh, summarizing our findings. So again, what we see is that VSG increases circulating bile acid levels to increase TGR5 signaling, which decreases hepatic CYP8B1 to improve bile acid profile um, and decrease inflammation to improve glucose regulation. Um, and we did assess inflammation, I just uh, didn't get into it today. Anyway, so uh, we were excited by these data and moving forward, wanted to better understand the role of TGR5 in the liver. Um, and so we focused in on the hepatocyte because hepatocytes are where bile acids are synthesized. Uh, we wanted to first see if uh, TGR5 is expressed in the hepatocyte. Um, so we did some IHC on liver sections. Um, so this is liver from TGR5 wild type mice and then liver from TGR5 knockout. Uh, TGR5 is in green and we co-stained with albumin in red uh, as a marker of hepatocytes. Um, and so we do find TGR5 is expressed in uh, hepatocytes, in wild type uh, liver, and this is lost in knockout, um, so showing antibody specificity. Uh, we also tested out our antibody on adipose tissue, which is a more uh, well-characterized tissue to express TGR5. And uh, similarly, we see TGR5 in green here uh, expressed in wild type adipose, but not in the knockout. Um, so with that data in hand, we moved into uh, working with a hepatocyte-specific TGR5 knockout mouse model uh, that we received from Dr. Christina Shujans. Um, and so we did an acute pharmacologic study. Uh, we fed mice, again, a high-fat diet for two months um, and then intervened with a really uh, specific and potent TGR5 agonist called compound 18. Uh, we dosed mice for three days and then did a glucose tolerance test. And so what we found was um, these lines are showing you the wild type groups. I'll put it over here. Um, so the solid line is the uh, saline treated wild type mice and then the dot dashed line in blue is the compound 18 treated mice. Um, and you can see that uh, this TGR5 agonist does improve glucose regulation in the wild type groups. Uh, and then we found that this was lost in the knockout groups that are shown here in red. Um, so this reveals a novel role for TGR5 signaling in the hepatocyte to regulate uh, glucose homeostasis uh, 
And we just published these data and are excited to uh, start to dive in and understand is this, what are the mechanisms? Is it related to bile acid metabolism? All right. So now I'm going to um, kind of switch to the other side of the coin and talk about the gut microbiome. Um, so overall, my lab is interested in targeting bile acids for the treatment of metabolic disease. And as I alluded to before, bile acid metabolism happens in two uh, key compartments primarily, um, in the liver and then in the gut microbiome. Um, and so just to review how this works, again, in the liver we make the primary bile acids. They're derived from cholesterol, um, and then our uh, conjugated to taurine or glycine. I'm just showing taurine conjugated here for the sake of simplicity. Um, and then they move into the gut, and gut microbes are able to first deconjugate these primary bile acids and can then convert these primary bile acids into secondary bile acids through a process known as 7-alpha dehydroxylation. Now, our understanding of bile acid metabolism in the liver is pretty comprehensive. However, our understanding of bile acid metabolism in the gut microbiome has some uh, key holes. Um, and so some of these are that we don't know all of the bacterial species involved in gut microbial bile acid metabolism, and we don't know all the genes involved. We've found that dietary fiber supplementation in mice dramatically increases 7-alpha dehydroxylation. And so this has given us a model with which to start to answer these questions of what are the bugs and what are the species or what are the genes. Um, and actually, instead of diving into that, I'm going to sort of jump ahead and talk about clinical application um, and talk about the question of, you know, if we change gut microbial bile acid metabolism, does this uh, improve glucose regulation in humans? Uh, so this was done in collaboration with a group at Harvard led by Jessica Allegretti. Um, and so they did the clinical study and then shared samples with us that we analyzed and I'll uh, present on today. So for the study, what they did was they recruited patients that uh, had obesity uh, but did not have metabolic disease. And these patients were treated with either placebo capsule or with these fecal microbiota transplantation capsules or FMT. And the FMT capsules were derived from a single lead donor. One of the things I really liked about their design was how uh, simple it was. There was no pretreatment of recipients with antibiotics, no GI washout. So, you know, a pretty straightforward approach that would be, I think, feasible, uh, feasibly applied clinically. Um, and so this was their study design. Um, they did a mixed meal tolerance test at baseline, um, and then patients underwent additional mixed meal tolerance tests at six weeks and 12 weeks of intervention. Um, and then they, in terms of treatment, uh, initiated FMT at baseline, and then uh, patients received additional capsules at four weeks and uh, eight weeks of intervention. So their initial outcome was weight loss. Um, Body weight did not, was not affected by FMT during this 12-week uh, uh, study. Nevertheless, they did find that um, the FMT treatment shifted uh, the gut microbiome to match that of the lead donor. And um, in terms of mechanism, they looked at a couple different things. And the one that shone through the most strongly was bile acid. So a uh, gut luminal bile acid profile shifted to match that of the lead donor. So with that in mind, we um, assessed the uh, samples from the mixed meal tolerance test. And so this is looking at the change in the glucose area under the curve from zero to six weeks. And we see a trend for this to be elevated in placebo compared with FMT. This reaches significance uh, when we look at the change from zero to 12 weeks. Um, similarly, we looked at the insulin area under the curve, and we found that uh, the insulin area under the curve was higher in placebo compared with FMT if we looked at the change from zero to six weeks. Uh, this trend was still present at zero to 12 weeks, but did not reach significance. Um, so overall, these data suggest 
that FMT might be able to delay the development of metabolic disease in patients with obesity. Um, and these are not, you know, incredibly dramatic data, uh, but I still find them exciting because uh, it was such an untargeted approach. Um, so to me, this suggests, I don't know, hope that if we could refine our FMT approach and make a more targeted approach, we could um, improve efficacy. So what we're working on now is again, to answer those questions of what are the genes and what are the species and can we modify or redesign an FMT to target gut microbial bile acid metabolism and um, achieve better efficacy. Um, and so with that, I'm going to switch over to um, our ILET GLP-1 work, but I am happy to pause and take any questions on this first part. Okay, I'll just keep going. Um, all right, so um, the other part of this presentation will focus on the role of GLP-1 in the metabolic benefits of bariatric surgery. GLP-1 is an incretin hormone, which means it potentiates glucose-stimulated insulin secretion from beta cells. And I'm going to present to you the classic model by which we think this works, and then some of the issues with this model. Um, so classically, the way we think this works is you eat a meal, and that stimulates your L cells to secrete GLP-1. It travels in the blood to the beta cell GLP-1 receptor, where it enhances glucose-stimulated insulin secretion from beta cells to decrease blood glucose levels. And so this is how we've thought it works for a long time. Um, but in recent years, we as a, I guess, diabetes research community have started to question this model for a couple of reasons. So one is that active GLP-1 levels are never really that high in the circulation. And this is because active GLP-1 is rapidly degraded by the enzyme DPP-4, rendering it to have a half-life of less than two minutes. Um, so as I go through my slides, I'll show you some of our data and how this has led us to propose a uh, somewhat revised model of how GLP-1 exerts its incretin effect, at least in the context of bariatric surgery. Um, and so VSG increases GLP-1 secretion. Uh, I'm going to show you some of our data from our mouse model. Um, this is, again, an oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, in blue, we have VSG, and in red, we've got the sham group. Um, this sham group has been uh, food restricted to match body weight to VSG. Um, so all the effects I'm showing here are, again, independent of body weight. Um, so we find that VSG uh, improves glucose tolerance and it dramatically increases glucose-stimulated insulin secretion and increases nutrient-stimulated GLP-1 secretion. Um, and these curves are similar to what you would see in humans. Um, and so since GLP-1 is an incretin hormone, we wanted to test the hypothesis that this increase in GLP-1 was driving the increase in insulin secretion to improve glucose tolerance. Um, and so to test this hypothesis, we used a tamoxifen-inducible beta cell-specific GLP-1 receptor knockout mouse model. I know that's a mouthful, but it's important. <laughs> um, and it's important for reasons that I kind of alluded to um, when I was talking about TGR-5. So with these whole body knockouts, again, you can have issues with compensation. Um, and so it's nice to have an inducible model because this helps mitigate the risk of confounding due to compensation. Um, so, uh, and then obviously looking at a beta cell specific uh, uh, model helps us hone in on uh, a specific cell type. Uh, so we studied the following four groups, so sham versus BSG, wild type versus knockout. Uh, mice again are on a high fat diet for two months prior to surgery. Uh, two weeks prior to surgery, we switched them over to a diet with tamoxifen. Uh, this induces the uh, knocked out of the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. Um, and all mice go on this tamoxifen supplemented diet and are maintained on it um, throughout study to ensure continued knockout of the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. Um, and we did some metabolic phenotyping and then collected uh, samples at six weeks after surgery. Um, and so uh, we did a couple different things. So here I'm showing uh, we measured uh, fasting plasma glucose and insulin concentrations to assess the quickie index of insulin sensitivity. And we found that this was improved in BSG wild type compared with sham, and that effect was lost in the knockouts. 
We found a similar effect during an oral glucose tolerance test. Again, glucose tolerance was improved in BSG wild type, and this effect was lost in the knockout. Similarly, we found that BSG increased insulin secretion during an oral glucose tolerance compared with sham in the wild type condition, but this was lost in the knockout. So these data together demonstrate that the beta cell GLP-1 receptor contributes to improved glucose regulation and improved islet function after VSG. We were particularly interested in this effect on islet function and wanted to better understand how does bariatric surgery and beta cell GLP-1 receptor signaling, um, how do these improve islet function? Before I get into that, I want to first uh, visit uh, the, the role of the alpha cell in diabetes. So the pancreatic alpha cell produces glucagon, and glucagon is overproduced in diabetes, and this has been shown to play an important role in diabetes pathogenesis. Um, and there's a lot of data out there to demonstrate this. Um, this is just one data set I found particularly compelling over the years. So this is looking at human patients with type 1 diabetes, um, and we're looking at their glycemic regulation under three different conditions. So in the first condition, we're looking at a low dose of insulin, um, so their glucagon levels are inappropriately elevated, and they remain hyperglycemic. Then if they uh, receive some somatostatin, this pushes glucagon levels down into a normal range, which essentially normalizes glycemia. Then if we add glucagon back, glucagon levels go back up, and we see a return to hyperglycemia. So these data and many others uh, demonstrate that uh, inhibition of glucagon action can be pretty uh, powerful in improving glucose regulation in both humans and animal models with diabetes. And this, of course, has led to numerous industry efforts to uh, develop glucagon receptor antagonists for diabetes treatment. These have unfortunately uh, been unsuccessful for the most part because of the development of negative side effects. Uh, so using our mouse bariatric model, we were uh, fortunate to identify a pathway that can actually shift what the alpha cell makes. So shift the alpha cell from making glucagon to making GLP-1. So essentially shifting the alpha cell from promoting diabetes um, to treating diabetes. Um, and so how is this possible? Um, so the way um, that this works is that we have to uh, visit the concept of proglucagon, which is the precursor of protein to GLP-1 and glucagon. Um, and the dogma has been that proglucagon is differentially cleaved depending on where it's expressed. So we thought that if proglucagon is expressed in an alpha cell, all of it's converted to glucagon. And if it's expressed in an L cell in the gut, all of it's converted to GLP-1. And we thought this because we thought that the enzymes that convert proglucagon were differentially expressed. So prohormone convertase 1,3, or PC1,3, is the enzyme that converts proglucagon to GLP-1, and we thought L cells only express PC1,3. And prohormone convertase 2, or PC2, is what converts proglucagon to glucagon, and we thought alpha cells only express PC2. However, it turns out that alpha cells can express PC1,3 under certain circumstances, and therefore can produce GLP-1. We uh, don't really understand what turns on PC1,3 in alpha cells, uh, but using our mouse bariatric model, we identified the beta cell GLP-1 receptor as something that can turn on alpha cell PC1,3 expression and GLP-1 production. Um, and so how did we find that? Um, so what we did is we went back to our bariatric model. So again, um, sham and BSG-operated mice either with the beta cell GLP-1 receptor or without the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. Uh, and we stained pancreas sections for GLP-1. Uh, and so GLP-1 is in red, and we find that it is elevated. Uh, islet GLP-1 is elevated in BSG wild type compared with sham. And this is lost in the knockout. And this is the quantification of those data. Uh, we found a similar effect on alpha cell uh, PC-1,3 expression. So together, these data demonstrate 
that BSG is able to increase islet GLP-1 expression, and this is dependent on the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. Um, so to summarize these previously published data, uh, you know, I didn't show all of the data, but I'll just uh, give you the highlights. So we find that the effect of BSG to lower body weight and food intake is independent of the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. But we find a role for the beta cell GLP-1 receptor in contributing to improved glucose regulation and improved islet function after BSG. And this seems to be related to a novel effect of VSG to increase islet GLP-1 expression in a beta cell GLP-1 receptor dependent fashion. Um, and so this was interesting because it identified two novel ideas. So one is that it identified an effect of VSG to induce islet GLP-1 expression. And second, it identifies a novel role for the beta cell GLP-1 receptor in the regulation of alpha cell proglucagon processing. So here's our model summarizing what we think is going on. So what we think is going on is that VSG increases gut-derived GLP-1. This increases beta cell GLP-1 receptor signaling, which causes the beta cell to secrete some unknown factor that can then act on the alpha cell to turn on PC13 expression and thereby enable GLP-1 production. We then think that this GLP-1 in the alpha cell can act in a paracrine fashion, uh, in a paracrine positive feedback loop back on the beta cell to further enhance glucose stimulated insulin secretion. Um, and so of course, this only led us to ask more questions. Um, and so I'll briefly introduce some of the ongoing work that we have on this. So first, we wanted to ask whether, is this model specific to bariatric surgery, or can a GLP-1 receptor agonist induce a, a similar effect? Is this translationally relevant in humans? And what are the mechanisms, or really more specifically, what's this question mark, um, and can we target it for diabetes treatment? Um, so starting with the first question, uh, we went back to our beta cell specific GLP-1 receptor knockout mouse model, and we treated mice either with saline, which is our control, or the GLP-1 receptor agonist liraglutide um, in wild type and knockout mice. Again, we used a study design similar to our bariatric study. Uh, so mice are on high fat diet for two months, two weeks prior to intervention, they go on to tamoxifen, again, to induce GLP-1 receptor knockout. And then they received either uh, liraglutide or saline injections twice daily for two weeks, and then we collected tissues. Um, and so this is the GLP-1 stating on pancreas sections. Um, and so we find that liraglutide induces islet GLP-1 expression compared with control in the wild type condition, but not in the knockout. And that's the quantification there. Uh, and we found a similar effect uh, on alpha cell PC13 expression. So these data show that uh, a GLP-1 receptor agonist can produce similar effects to uh, what we see after VSG, that um, a GLP-1 receptor agonist can turn on alpha cell GLP-1 and this is dependent on the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. And so this was great, because basically this allowed us to then do some translational work. So obviously, this question of translation is always important. Uh, it's very important in islet biology, because uh, islets are very different between mice and humans, uh, which is illustrated in the uh, IHC images. So this is a mouse islet, this is a human islet, um, insulin's in red, and glucagon is in green. And so you can see in the mouse, uh, there's the beta cells form the core of the islet, and you've got alpha cells on the periphery. In the human, you've got proportionally more alpha cells, and they're more intermixed with one another. So in order to answer this question of translation, uh, we turn to a single cell RNA sequencing approach, because this allowed us to take into account the heterogeneity that can exist uh, within alpha cells and beta cells. And so uh, we used this DartSeq platform, which was developed by our collaborators at Cornell. Uh, so single cell RNA sequencing has been you know, revolutionary uh, in biology, uh, but like all new technologies, it's not without its limitations. And one of these is that they can have low sensitivity 
for lowly expressed transcripts. And we wanted to look at a lowly expressed transcript, which is uh, PCSK1. That's the transcript that encodes PC13, which is the enzyme you need to make GLP1. Um, so we were particularly worried about this uh, sensitivity issue. Um, and so this is why we use this DartSeq platform, because it directly addresses sensitivity. Um, and so what it is, is a modification of uh, the original DropSeq platform. So in DropSeq, you use this bead-based approach, um, where you use these beads that have uh, universal probes that will attach to any poly-A-tailed mRNA transcript. In DartSeq, what you do is you replace uh, some of these universal probes with probes that are specific for your transcript of interest. Um, and so uh, what we did was we first uh, applied DartSeq to the study of human islets and validated its use, validated that it improves sensitivity, um, and it does. And then uh, we dug into figuring out uh, what's the effect of a GLP-1 receptor agonist on alpha cell PCSK1. Um, and so to do this, we developed DartSeq beads that had probes for our target of interest, PCSK1, um, and also probes for the transcripts that encode glucagon and insulin. We received islets from uh, human cadaveric donors that were non-diabetic, and we treated islets with either saline or liraglutide, uh, and then performed DartSeq. All right, and so then this is a UMAP of that data. Um, and so just to orient us, uh, the way I'm presenting this is that uh, we've got the control uh, islets here and then the liraglutide treated islets here. Um, this data represents an N of three. Uh, so we did this on uh, islets isolated from three different individuals. Um, and what the UMAP is showing you is um, each dot represents a cell. And these cells are clustered based on how similar or different their transcriptomes are. Um, and so as you can see, uh, we, we saw quite a bit of heterogeneity in the alpha cell and beta cell populations. So we saw four different alpha cell populations and five different beta cell populations. So before even trying to know what liraglutide was doing, we wanted, wanted to just understand what was driving this heterogeneity. And so to do that, uh, we did a couple of things, uh, but what I'm going to hone in on is uh, this pseudo time analysis, which I'm sorry if this is scary, but I'll walk you through it. Um, it's fine <laughs> um, and kind of exciting. And so what this is, is it's looking at these four transcripts um, and their expression across these different cell clusters. Um, and so what we have on the left here is alpha four, and then we drop down to alpha one, and then switch over to beta one, up to beta four and five. And so the first two that we're looking at are ARX and DNMT1. They are markers of mature alpha cells. And they are most highly expressed in the alpha fours, and decrease down to the alpha ones, and then continue to decrease across the beta cells. Um, and so this suggests that our alpha fours are our most mature alpha cells, and that the alpha-1 population is our least mature cell population. We also looked at MAF-A and PDX-1. These are uh, markers of mature beta cells, and they are low in the alpha cell populations, and then increase across the beta cell populations. So suggesting that the beta-1 population is our most immature beta cell population. Um, so together, these data suggest that the heterogeneity that we're seeing uh, is actually driven by uh, markers of cell identity and maturity. So then the next thing we wanted to see was, you know, what is the effect of liraglutide on differential gene expression? Um, and so we honed in on this alpha-1 population because we found that liraglutide did induce a 1.6 log-fold increase in PCSK1. Uh, in the alpha-1 population. Uh, so basically showing that our findings in mice do appear to have translational relevance in this uh, subset of alpha cells. Now, um, PCSK1 is a beta cell gene. You need PCSK1 to make, uh, to process proinsulin. And gene expression regulation rarely happens in isolation. So perhaps not too surprisingly, along with PCSK1, we saw other uh, beta cell specific genes go up in response to liraglutide 
in this alpha-1 population. So we saw increases in the transcripts that express or encode uh, insulin, isla amyloid polypeptide, and the beta cell-specific transcription factor, MAF-A. Um, and so this was really exciting because it suggests that this effect of liraglutide to induce alpha cell GLP-1 might be part of a broader pathway by which we're shifting cell fate. And we were particularly interested in the fact that this happened predominantly in the alpha-1 population, which is our least mature cell population. Um, and so this is speculative at this point, but it suggests that maybe this immature cell population is more malleable to uh, changes. Um, so we then, of course, did some IHC to validate these findings. Um, this is, again, in human islets uh, from human cadaveric donors that were not diabetic. Uh, islets were treated with liraglutide or saline. We also looked at islets at the time of receipt just to control for shipment. Um, and this is looking at GLP-1 expression in red. We find that liraglutide increases islet GLP-1 expression in humans. That's the quantification. And we also wanted to validate um, whether we're really seeing this increase in bihormonal uh, insulin and glucagon double positive cells at the level of protein. Um, and so insulin's in red, glucagon's in green, and co-localizations in yellow. Um, and we do see an increase in these yellow cells in islets that received liraglutide, and that's the quantification. Um, so together, these data uh, support our DART-seq data and support that liraglutide can increase islet GLP-1 expression and bihormonal cells. And I should uh, uh, show that this is um, you know, not, not out of nowhere. There's precedent for this in the literature. There are two prior studies in mice that show that uh, globally increased GLP-1 receptor signaling can promote transdifferentiation of alpha cells into beta cells. Um, so the last piece of data, um, so we were then interested in going back to our mouse model to see if this is really uh, due to the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. Um, the beta cells are the predominant cell type to express the GLP-1 receptor in the islet, uh, but other endocrine cell types can express it as well. Um, and so we went back to our uh, liraglutide and saline treated wild type and beta cell GLP-1 receptor knockout mice and looked at co-localization of insulin and glucagon. Um, and we found that liraglutide did increase co-localization or did increase these bihormonal uh, insulin glucagon double positive cells um, in the wild type mice, but not in the knockouts. So this data shows that the effect of liraglutide to increase bihormonal cells is dependent on the beta cell GLP-1 receptor. Um, and so just to wrap up, this is uh, kind of where we're at. Um, so we find that yes, um, the effect that we see in bariatric surgery can be recapitulated by a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, and we find that this does have translational relevance in humans. And we find that this is associated with increased expression of other beta cell genes, suggesting that there's a shift in cell fate. So we're gearing up right now to do some lineage tracing studies to start to hone in on whether there truly is a, a change in cell fate at play. We are also uh, doing some work to uh, figure out what is this beta cell secreted factor that can essentially reprogram alpha cells. Um, and so to do this, we're studying islets from our mouse BSG operated mice um, and islets from human cadaveric donors um, and collecting, uh, collecting me media off the islets to look at what the beta cells are secreting um, and doing proteomics for target identification. Um, and in parallel, we're gearing up to do a high throughput chemical library screen to identify uh, what compounds can turn on alpha cell PC13 and GLP1, um, and can we develop that into a drug? Um, and so with that, I will uh, wrap up and thank the many uh, people who uh, have helped with this work. Um, there are many, uh, so Dr. Charles Danko uh, has been hugely helpful in the genomics work I presented. Uh, our collaborators at Eli Lilly have been helpful throughout. Uh, Dr. Kyle Sloop in particular uh, is the one who developed the uh, beta cell GLP-1 receptor knockout mouse that we've been working with. 
Uh, and then of course I am very fortunate to have uh, an amazing group of people to work with in my lab. Um, and so uh, just to run through who did what, uh, starting at the top, um, the uh, TGR5 work was led by my former graduate student, Dr. Darlene Garame, and former postdoc, Dr. Ann McGavigan. Um, the more recent TGR5 work uh, has been completed by Marlena Holter, a DVM PhD student in the lab, and Margot Chirichian, a really talented undergraduate student in the lab. And then the published GLP-1 work uh, was done again by Dr. Darlene Garame and a very talented vet student, Dr. John Liu. And the ongoing GLP-1 work, um, the mouse part is being done by Marlena Holter. And then the genomics has been led by Dr. Mirdu Sakai, a research associate in the lab. Uh, and then we're grateful to our funders uh, and of course grateful to uh, the human islet donors and their families. Um, and with that, I will take questions. So thank you for that great presentation and particularly rising to the challenge to give I talk like that to a bunch of surgeons. <laughs> there are, you know, there are a couple of comments that I want to make. One is for anybody who, you know, has worked with Dr. Ali in some of the adult bariatric cases, we think it's hard doing it on a human. Can you imagine doing that operation on a mouse? So that's first of all, you know, congratulations to that great skill and talent <laughs> Thank that you, you. have. Um, secondly, it's just a reminder of what a complex organism we are and all of the perturbations that we create when we do an operation that has ramifications in this amazing cascade of molecular biology that occurs subsequently and even though you do sham versus operated uh, operations you know we've just seen a difference in the way human beings recover from big operations and minimally invasive operations, and there's, there's an underlying biology that needs to be figured out there as well. Yeah. I also um, just want to congratulate and, and think more on really trying to understand why bariatric surgery seems to work. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to admit I was a non-believer, Muhammad, no offense, and when this first came out I thought, you know, this is nonsense. It's just they lost weight, and so all those good effects of losing weight, you know, to uh, patients with bariatric surgery, but you and many others have shown that in fact there's something else that happens early. So it does make you wonder when we take out, you know, what part of the stomach, or why does a, you know, why does a, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy work seem to work similarly well? And you've yeah. got models that can answer these questions. Yep. So there are a lot, a lot more questions that can come out of this. Yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, turn it over to Dr. Greenhall. Very nice work. Um, so my question is the proximal signaling from the stomach. Mm -hmm. And is there a volume of stomach that is the minimal amount that causes these signaling? Because can you just take a tiny chunk or can we take a little wedge out? Um, or is, what's that? Or which wedge? Yeah. Yeah, or which wedge? Because that's the key question. Because it's yeah. interesting that, you know, you can do a sleeve gastrectomy, but you know, people can do a total gastrectomy and look at the same kind of findings. But so can you just make an incision in the stomach and close it? Does that have short term effects? I mean, so there must be some kind of volume or what the signal from proximally might be. I guess that's one of my questions. Yeah. It's one of mine too. So, um, but I'll tell you. So, so that's a study that we've been wanting to do for a while. We have not done in house. Um, I do believe that there are some uh, preclinical modeling studies done uh, looking at that question, and they do see kind of what you would expect if you uh, make a less restrictive sleeve. You have less less efficacy on weight loss, but you still see a lot of the same effects. And I think that goes back to kind of this idea of like, that's why I show Ruin Y and uh, BSG right next to each other. Obviously, you know, they, there are differences in their efficacy, but to me, like the differences in the surgery types are just, they're wildly different and they still are producing all the same effects on hormones and are still both very potently effective. So it, I have not looked into this, but something I've always wanted to go after is, you know, 
it's there's got to be more to the the neurobiology related to this um, cuz you know if it was just a question of like oh you know how much we're taking off or which bit we're taking off um, i would expect to see more dramatic differences between these different surgeries and um, and I'm not saying that there aren't differences. There are, but um, it, I, I've been suspicious, suspicious that there might be more of a neural uh, mechanism at play than we appreciate. So I have a question also about the gut microbiome. There's a lot of studies that you can try to influence it, but in the long run, you know, I'll eat yogurt. I still gain weight. So it's uh, <laughs> can you really change the gut microbiome of people? Because it seems like. Uh, no matter what, what you do, what you eat, whether you get sick, you get salmonella or whatever, you still end up not really changing your weight path and how yeah. much calories you can consume. Yeah, to all of it, I feel like I've always uh, kind of been a gut microbiome skeptic. Um, like, I think that it's you know really important and underappreciated and there's so much we have to learn. But it was really actually collaborating on the FMT study that got me so excited about it. Because I, like I said, it was such a simple approach. They just used these FMT capsules and they did shift the microbiome. And, you know, it wasn't earth shattering the effects we saw in the patients. You know, they didn't lose body weight, but we did see this, uh, you know, tendency to delay development of glucose intolerance. And so, you know, for me, I was just like, wow, like using such an untargeted approach, we can still shift the microbiome and still elicit a, a biological effect. And, you know, this seems like in the grand scheme of things, a pretty safe approach, right? Like we can take this orally, um, you know, there shouldn't be too many side effects. Um, so I'm excited about the potential for the microbiome as a target for metabolic disease, but I kind of feel like we're still at that place where there's so much more we need to learn to refine these these approaches. Cause just using a, you know, FMT from a lean donor, eating yogurt with, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, kind of random mix of microbes, you know, might not be enough to do it, but if we can figure out the key elements, right. maybe we can. Yeah, when you uh, have the pharmacologic weight loss um, process in place, Dr. Ali will go out of business. So it's, uh, <laughs> Okay. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you on a really captivating talk, and oh, I, I really appreciate your enthusiasm. It's really palpable for this novel um, area. And I see a lot of parallels in uh, metabolic diseases in my field. I'm a yeah. colon and rectal surgeon, yeah. and there's a lot of data out there about the effect of bile acid and fiber in the uh, origins of conditions like cancer, but also diverticular disease. Yeah. And so my question, uh, well, one comment about the microbiome, we can shift our microbiome. Yep. That's been shown in fiber studies. Yep. When we put humans on high fiber diets, it does shift the levels of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium levels in a significant way yep. to reduce inflammation. But my question is regarding when you alter the way that pancreas is working, does that have an effect on the microbiome? Do you see a shift in bacterial load in the large um, intestine. I don't know if that's really been looked at, but that's a good question. Just curious about that. Yeah, and sorry, you touched on a lot of things. So sorry, I'm just sorting out my my thoughts. So one is, I just wanted to go back to what you were saying about the roles, of, the effects of bile acids on um, you know diseases of the colon. Um, that's another reason why I'm interested in gut microbial bile acid metabolism. I'm looking at it, you know, more in the metabolic disease realm, but it's so important in all these other disease processes too. So again, there's a lot of potential application. Uh, going back to your question of does what's happening in the pancreas or just in general hormones, is there in a, an interplay with the microbiome? Uh, yes. And like all things, it seems like it's bi-directional. Um, so there's recent work that showed that gut microbes can, uh, I don't know, chew away at GLP-1. So gut microbes influence GLP-1. And I believe that there's data suggesting, and I think that we have to look into this more deeply, uh, but that you know, uh, various hormones like GLP-1 can also influence the composition of the microbiome. But I think that we have to, um, you know, it's kind of a chicken or the egg sort of thing. Thank you. Question first from our colleagues out in the cybersphere. Oh. This one's from Sean Adams. Uh, Bethany, very well presented and quite novel and innovative. Congratulations. 
Can you please speculate a bit? Might these uh, liraglutide effects and hormone switches associate with local immune events and pancreatitis risk? Uh, any evidence for inflammation markers or macrophage changes locally in the different mouse models? Uh, okay, so I know. <laughs> well done, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, We're making a scientist out of it. I know, I love it. <laughs> um, Wait, okay. Yeah, so uh, Lyra Blue Tide, there's been um, a debate and speculation in the field uh, a while back about whether these uh, GLP-1 analogs promote pancreatitis. Um, and I believe that has been heavily studied and squashed. Um, but, okay, and so the question I think was about whether, sorry, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Rhyolitude effects and hormones, which is associated with local immune events and pancreatitis risk. Yeah, um, I, so we haven't looked at uh, we haven't looked at inflammatory markers in the pancreas yet. Um, I do think that would be um, interesting. And GLP-1 does have a, a, a role in immunology, so it's entirely likely that there um, there might be some interplay there. But I don't know yet. Important role for mouse models. All right, Dr. Ali, you get the last word today. Dr. Cummings, um, thank you very much for sharing your, your data with us, and, and congratulations on a really spectacular start to a relatively young career. I mean, well, really you. amazing stuff. Um, a couple things. Um, I personally have been more of a microbiome believer from, from the beginning, and so I, I, there's so much in your talk that I could talk about, but I Got two, I'm going to hone it down to two things. The first of which is about the, um, you know, the FMT work and, and that whole line. Um, first of all, I, I hope that they coat the FMT capsules in like bubblegum flavor or something, because otherwise <laughs> that's going to be a problem. Oh, but, <laughs> but secondly, I would say that um, have you thought of linking a xenometabolomic approach to your work looking at bile acids and its effects on the microbiome because that gives us a much quicker and easier way and, and really a more clinically applicable way to be able to kind of measure where the, per, where the patient is and the effectiveness of treatment rather than collecting stool all the time. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, it would be great to uh, kind of broaden our understanding of the, the effects on bile acids and beyond, right? And so uh, where we are right now is we're gearing up to start analyzing these FMT samples in depth. So I would be happy to <laughs> include xenometabolites in that. I think that would be really uh, valuable. And I think you also hit on something else that I, I don't think I really fully enunciated, but um, part of the reason why I'm excited about the microbiome too is that I feel like it enables uh, a, an approach that's uh, amenable to more personalized therapy. So can, I, I think that's what you were getting at, can we screen individuals uh, up front and then kind of decide, you know, what, <laughs> what uh, we need to target in order to uh, elicit a clinical effect? Yeah, a little surgery, a little yogurt, a little... <laughs> a, a, yeah. Absolutely, multimodal therapy. Um, and I just would like to talk about the, the pancreas work, which I think is, is phenomenal and novel. So congratulations on that. Um, I, I do acknowledge the role for TGR5, um, and I think it's, it's very important. Um, you, you, f you found TGR5 in the liver, which we had traditionally thought might not be that prevalent, but attributing the, attributing the function of bile acids on the liver, and especially the intersection between bile acid regulation and glucose homeostasis to TGR5 and kind of ignoring FXR existing there, um, I think that needs to be teased out a bit more because FXR we know is there. We know it intersects bile acids and glucose homeostasis. What, what are your thoughts on that, and how do you plan to, to tease that out? What, what's, what's TGR5 responsible for? What's FXR responsible for? Yeah, and I, so I didn't mean to imply that uh, <laughs> FXR is not involved. It's definitely involved. Um, we've just been focusing on TGR5 because, you know, got to start somewhere, right? Um, yeah. 
so obviously they're both involved and I think that you know again like I've been saying I'm interested in just figuring kind of figuring out how are these surgeries working and what are what are the new therapeutic uh, targets that can come, come out of this and so FXR has a very important role in the regulation of hepatic bile acid metabolism and um, you know I, I would be interested uh, in doing studies in uh, liver specific FXR knockouts to see what the contribution of FXR is to all of that uh, but we were excited about the TGR5 component because there's a lot more new biology there. We, we know that FXR uh, regulates uh, these uh, uh, pathways. And in fact, um, I kind of alluded, it's such a, it's such a deep topic, <laughs> so I kind of sure. went superficial on it, but um, FXR regulates CYP8B1 and CYP7A1. And the issue there is it downregulates both of them. And so that was what I was saying, you know, in terms of a therapeutic, you don't really want to downregulate CYP71 because you're blocking bile acid metabolism and blocking, you know, an important clearance uh, mechanism for cholesterol. And so that's why I was like, oh, you know, TGR5 is able to downregulate just cyp 8 p one now, I don't think TGR5 is a good therapeutic target. It, you know, there have been agonists made and they have off-target effects because TGR5 has an important role in uh, the biliary system. And so these agonists cause gallbladder filling and uh, cholelithiasis. So um, what we're interested in doing on the TGR5 side of things is figuring out, you know, what's the downstream mediator by which TGR5 regulates cyp 8 b one and could that be a, a viable target? Uh, and, you know, again, I didn't get into it, but we have done a lot of sequencing and identified uh, microRNAs as a potential downstream mediator that could be, you know, a therapeutic approach from that angle. But I completely agree, you know, I think it'd be nice to do some more preclinical modeling work to really tease apart, you know, what's FXR doing to bile acid metabolism and what's TGR5 doing. And, we're starting to build those tools. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank well, you. Thank you again. It's really hard not to appreciate the implication of obesity in so many of the other diseases that we look at, whether it's diabetes and metabolic diseases or cancer or heart disease. And I think this partnership of basic science colleagues like yourself and clinicians really is the magic that uh, makes a lot of these new discoveries happen. So thank you so much. Thank you.